Okay, uh, good morning, uh, FR candidates, financial reporting candidates. Okay, uh, today is uh, Saturday, the 10th of February 2024. Uh, we will more or less be talking about uh, group accounts today. Uh, in our last uh, section or class, we've introduced ourselves to business combination. Okay, we we'll talk extensively within the perspectives of uh, IFRS 3. Okay, we now know what business combination is, uh, regardless of the form. We also know that uh, we use a single methodology of accounting, which is the acquisition method in accounting at the point of acquisition, and regardless of the form of business combination. Okay, two things are either possible. Either we have uh, a form of subsumption, which means uh, where the two or more businesses that come together from a new one or one in life business, okay, or where they create a place of CDI relationships, okay? And uh, in that case, we, we more or less consider one, creating a subsidiary, and therefore you have a group structure, okay? Why the other one, there is no subsidiary, it's just a single entity that came out of that uh, marriage, okay? And in that situation, we we'll say group does not exist. Therefore, it means that uh, you are only technically to prepare group account on the premise that um, you have a group. And uh, today we'll discuss what a group comprises of and what form of structures exist within a group. We'll look at that. But last time we discussed about control. Okay, looking at control from various perspectives, okay? And the, the perspective of IFRS 3 is what we have adopted. And we said for examination purposes, sometimes uh, you also look at the quantitative pressure, which is much more of the perspective of what it was before the revised uh, position. But again, we'll be demonstrating our understanding of all of these as a uh, and goes on. Okay. Uh, as I've said earlier, uh, before now, you can see on your screen, okay? I can think what you can see on your screen is my Kindle account, okay? In that Kindle account, I think you can see um, the material that's somewhat we are adopting for all of our discussions, okay? okay? And that is a contemporaneous accounting for business uh, combination, okay? And all of what is required will more or less have access to it as we move on in the course of this discussion, okay? Now, I think uh, I can want to open it. Um, Now, there are some terminologies that I will introduce us to, but we don't need to bother cramming whatever those terminologies are. Uh, what matter is to have understanding of them. And as you are moving on, we'll be making use of all of these terminologies intermittently, and that will not be a big deal to us. Okay, in that. Um, this is the Kindle version of the material. Okay, which makes it easy for me to more or less uh, move around, which is more or less like the soft copy version. Okay, uh, today we'll be looking at chapter two, which is a uh, basic principle of group account. Okay, uh, I think where I just want to more or less uh, go to is um, the aspect of talking about um, group and group structure. Okay, now. I want somebody to volunteer to read something out as we begin the session. If you volunteer, please kindly just um, show by simplifying with a show of hand, okay? And I can give you access. Okay. Uh, I've given you access to the bar of the mother. So let me enlarge this. Mm 
The bro, are you muted? Okay. Okay, if you are this show of hand, just raise up your hand, not on the chat, but using the participant page. Okay. Um, okay, bless you, Anna, for wish you. You can lose yourself. Have we done that? Yes, sir. Okay. okay, over to you. Let me just... Um... Okay, these are the following terminologies. Okay, you can start from here. Definition of terms. Over to you. Okay, sir. The following termination apply to business combination and group accounts as defined by relevant IFRS group, a parent and its subsidiaries, parents, an entity that controls one or more entities, subsidiary, an entity that is controlled by another entity known as the parent, business combination, a transaction or other event in which an acquirer obtains control of one or more businesses. Transactions sometimes refers to as true measures or measures of equals are also business combination as that term is used in the IFRS. Consolidated financial statement, that's group account. The financial statement of a group in which the assets, liabilities, equity, income, expenses, and cash flows of the parents and its subsidiaries are present, presented as those of a single entity, single economic entity. Control of an investee. This is an investor, an investor control an investee when investor is exposed or has rights to variable returns from its involvement with the investee and has the ability to affect those returns through its power over the investee. Control was earlier defined by the old IAS 27 as revised in 2008 as the power to govern the financial and operating policy, policies of an entity so as to obtain benefits from its activities. Significant influence. The power to participate in the financial an operating policy decision of an investee or an economic activity, but is not controlled or joint control over those policies. Power, existing rights that give the current ability to direct the relevant activities. Associate, an entity including an unincorporated entity, such as partnership, in which an investor has significant influence and which is neither a subsidiary nor a joint joint venture of the investor non-controlling his interest the equity in a subsidiary not attributable directly or indirectly to a parent also as a proportion of the net asset of a subsidiary entity that belongs to investor outside the group acquisition dates the dates on which the acquirer obtains control of the acquiry identifiable. An asset is identifiable if it either is separable, that is capable of being separated or divided from the entity and sold, transferred, licensed, rented, or exchanged either individually or together with a related contract identifiable asset or liability I don't know where I am okay and if and identifiable assets 
Oh my God. Identifiable asset or liability, regardless of whether the entity intends to do so or arises from contractual or other legal activity, regardless of whether those rights are transferable or separable from the entity or from other rights and obligations. Intangible assets. An unidentifiable non monetary asset without physical substance. Goodwill. An asset representing the future economic benefits arising from other assets acquired in a business combination that is not individually identified and separately recognized. It is measured primarily as the excess of the cost of consideration over the fair value of the net asset acquired. Yeah, cost of combination. This represents the consideration transferred or transferable to the investee upon the acquisition by the investor. This includes cash consideration, shares consideration, present value or discounted value of contingent consideration. The consideration transferable is measured at the acquisition date. Fair value of the total consideration transferred and the acquisition date. Fair value of each major class of consideration such as cash, other tangible or intangible assets, including a business subsidiary of the acquirer. Liability incurred, for example, a liability for contingent consideration and equity interest of the acquirer, including the number of instruments or interest issued or issuable and the method of examining the fair value of those instruments or interest. Contingent consideration, usually an obligation of the acquirer to transfer additional assets or equity interest to the former owners of the acquiry as part of the exchange for control of the transferable, control of the acquiry if specified in, if specified future events or cause or conditions are met. The otherwise is a consideration transferable to the investee in the future by the parents, that is the investor, upon the occurrence of future events. Fair value, the price that will be received to sell an asset or paid to transfer a liability in an orderly transaction between market participants and the, at the measurement date. Fair value was earlier defined in IFRS 3 before the introduction of IFRS 13 as the amount for which an asset can be exchanged or a liability settled between knowledgeable willing parties in an arm's length transaction. Net asset. This refers to the share capital and reserves of the subsidiary at any point in time. Pre-acquisition reserve. This is the reserve of the subsidiary existing at the date of acquisition of controlling interest by the holding parent, parent company. Post-acquisition reserve. This is the reserve of the subsidiary generated by subsequent to the date of acquisition of controlling interest by the holding company, which is the parent company. The Acquiry, the business or businesses that acquire of, acquirer obtain control of in a business, in a business combination. Acquirer, the entity that obtains control of the acquiry. Entity interest, broadly used in IFRS to mean ownership interest. Bargain purchase, this of course when the cost of consideration is less than the fair value of the subsidiary net asset required or acquired. Decision maker, an entity with decision making rights that is either a principal or an agent for other parties. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yes, it's just to, the most important one for now, which we are going to be using are those that you've read uh, earlier. I think uh, we just need to take it up from here. And uh, thank you very much for that. Now, last weekly, we'll come back to some rationales, OK? OK? Um, but last weekly, go back to uh, 
group. Okay, we know what a group is. Let's not talk about group structure. Okay, in this case. Now, last time we had a discussion, we talked about accounting for business combination, which is the acquisition method. Okay, this also reiterated most of what we discussed earlier. But our position here is to more or less look at the group structure. And I'll go to chapter four there, where we'll be talking about basic principle of group accounts. Okay, there we'll look at this structure first. Okay, now what is group structure in this case? Okay, uh, the fundamental group structure can come in four shapes. Okay, when I say four shapes or uh, four forms, is that we can have a call a simple subsidiary. Now, when we talk about a simple subsidiary, we are talking about a situation where, or uh, a simple group. Yeah, we are talking about a situation where we only have two members in the group. Okay, who are the two members? We have the parent, which is usually the norm, and we have a subsidiary. Okay, remember that the parent is the entity that controls the other. Okay, why subsidiary is the other entity subjected to control of uh, the other business. Okay, in this case, what happened is that we only have two members in the group, parent and subsidiary. But in another fashion, it's possible that a parent has more than a child, which means it will have two or more children. And in that case, what happens? We have two or more subsidiaries. Okay, which means a parent have control over subsidiary A, subsidiary B, or extend it to subsidiary C, extend it to D, E, and the likes, okay? In that case, we will find such a group as a, a group of fellow subsidiaries, okay? And in that situation, each of those subsidiaries, since they stand alone, but they are having something in common on the premise that they have a single parent, in that situation, we we'll call them fellow subsidiaries of that parent entity, okay? The third one, where we start to move into a complex structure is where we have a parent that has a subsidiary. The subsidiary has matured enough to equally have his own subsidiary. Similarly to who human being, you have a parent and you yourself, you are a parent to your own child. And in that case, you can see your child as the grandson or granddaughter or grandchild of your parent, okay? And that is where we talk about uh, indirect structure, okay? And uh, what we call sub-subsidiary structure. And in that case, you have the parent having subsidiary A and that parent also having subsidiary A, that subsidiary A having subsidiary B. Which means in this case, we can simply say for short sure that subsidiary A is a subsidiary of parents, while subsidiary B is a subsidiary of subsidiary A. And inversely, we can also say subsidiary B is the sub-subsidiary of parents. With the sub-subsidiary means is a subsidiary of the subsidiary to the parent. Okay, otherwise you can also consider it as an indirect subsidiary of the parent. Because, for example, your own son is indirectly the son of your father, but a grandson. And that's what we mean by that. Okay. And lastly, we can have a structure we call a joint group or a joint subsidiary group. Okay. Sometimes we call it a mixed group. Sometimes, because of the shape, some people call it a D shaped group. Okay. What does that signify? It signifies a situation where a parent and a subsidiary jointly in a manner obtain control of another subsidiary. What does that simply mean? If you look at the structure here, you find out that a parent first has a subsidiary, but in one way or the other, both the parent and the subsidiary A jointly invested in a manner such that B becomes subsidiary of the group, okay, or subsidiary within the group in that case. And we are going to see some of them. But at the level of our discussion, at this level of the ICAM program, which is synonymous with the same thing at ACCA program, at foundation and skill levels, 
you will only somewhat be restricted to a single subsidiary group because this is what will lay foundation for everything. Okay, which is just a marginal understanding we need to know to consolidate it more than a subsidiary, which we would like this to consider. Whereas at the professional level, which is the final level of both ICANN and ACA program, is where we'll be looking at complex group, where we'll be looking at indirect subsidiary and gen subsidiary, okay, as the case may be. But for now, we'll be looking at single subsidiary. But again, these are the fundamental structures we have. But that doesn't stop us having other structures, which is more or less like a mix of those structures. Now, let me draw something for you. Okay, and I want somebody to use our understanding to explain something. Let's look at the structure where we have the parents. The parent as subsidiary one. The parent as subsidiary two. And X two. Let me say X four. X one as a subsidiary I. Now, who can delineate this structure? Who can delineate this structure? You can raise up your hand if you want to delineate this structure. OK, Z. You can permit and give me access. OK, good morning, sir. So yeah, um yeah. subsidiary one, two, three, and four. They are all they are fellow subsidiaries. And they are fellow subsidiaries of the parents. Okay. Why subsidiary five is a sub is a subsidiary of subsidiary one, which that is subsidiary one is its own parent, but it is sub subsidiary to the parents. Okay, continue. So subsidiary six is a sub subsidiary to subsidiary um two and three. So subsidiary two and three jointly um more like they jointly acquired or produced subsidiary six. Okay. Then subsidiary seven is a sub subsidiary to sub to subsidiary two and subsidiary three, because subsidiary six is more like its own parent. Okay. Is that all? Yes. And it's okay. also a sub sub subsidiary to the parents. Okay. Okay. Subsidiary one, two, and three are fellow subsidiaries. Of the parents. Is that correct? Okay. Why subsidiary five? is a subsidiary of subsidiary one and a sub-subsidiary or an indirect subsidiary of parents. Okay. Uh, three subsidiary six is a joint subsidiary of 
of subsidiary two and subsidiary three. And an indirect subsidiary of the parent. Okay, uh, for subsidiary seven is a subsidiary of subsidiary six and an indirect subsidiary of subsidiary two, subsidiary three, and ultimately The parent. Do we understand this that way? Okay. That is that. Any question at this point? Any question at this point? Okay, if there's no question. Now, lastly, foundation for group account, okay? What then is group account? It is accounts of a group that is that of the parents and its subsidiaries as seen is accounts of a single entity. That is group account, which is for short, group account at the lowest level is made up of the parents' account on a line by line basis, combined or consolidated with the subsidiaries accounts on the same line by line route business. Now, if you recall that um, for financial statements, we have five components. And uh, what we'll be doing is that the role of the five components will be consolidated by this simple expression but subject to some fundamental adjustments, which we are going to lay as principles for consolidation. There are three fundamental or otherwise known as basic principles of consolidation. Those are the principles we are going to lay down today. Okay, the question then is, what are the fundamental principles of consol? Relation. We will be unveiling them one by one using a mentorsory and illustrative approach so that there's no need for you to come but have better understanding of it all. Okay. Intermittently, if you have questions, you can show by signifying your hand or send the chat. I can access them at the same time. Okay. Sorry.
consolidation principles. Everything we'll be discussing here, we'll use illustration to do that. Okay, I want somebody to volunteer to read something before we continue. Can you signify with your hand? Okay, I wait someone to signify so that we can move on. Okay, uh, Patrick, I will do a quick job. What about you? You can mute. Uh, okay. Yeah, um, yeah, let's read this based on the understanding of the group structures. Okay, sorry, I've not shared that screen. Let me share the screen. Thank you. What about you? Uh, based on the understanding of the group structures, we can now proceed to learn most of the basic principles and mechanics of, consolidate, of consolidation by adopting a simple group structure with a single subsidiary. Once we are able to grasp the required principles, we then apply same to other forms of group structures later in this text. The general principle of consolidation is that the financial statement of a parent and its subsidiaries are combined on a line by line basis by adding together like items of assets, liabilities, et Hello? Hello? It seems his network is poor. Who else can continue from there? Okay. Uh, Dubbies Entertainment, over to you. All right. Good morning, sir. Yeah, good money. Start from the general principles. Okay, general principles. The, the general principles of consolidation is that is that the financial statement. Uh, I've been challenged here. Okay. Now, uh, the person with 0996364, I'm giving you access. Okay. The general principle of the consolidation is that the financial statements of a parent and its subsidiaries are combined on a line by line basis by adding together like items of assets, liabilities, equity income and expenses, subject to necessary adjustments, termed group adjustments. Thank you. Now there's emphasis on this, which I'll print in, uh, let me print it in blue or uh, amber. Now there's emphasis on this equity, which is a stay, which means uh, it's not straight jacket. The same way we'll have done assets, liabilities, income and expenses. I will know the reason for that later. Okay, now yes, continue. Technical notes on that mm -hmm. reason why I lighted the equity. Uh, okay, sir. Equity is being at risk so, be, because most parts of the equity, that is equity of the subsidiary at acquisition are not, are not consolidated, but rather channeled, canceled, out upon consolidation. The principle alongside other principles will be learned in the course of the study. The principle to be learned will be useful in ensuring the preparation of group accounts, which entails the following statements. One, consolidated statements of financial position. Two, consolidated statements of profit or loss and other comprehensive income. Three, consolidated statements of changes in equity. Four, 
consolidated statements of cash flow. In this phase, we will start our understanding of the principle from the perspective of, pre of presenting the consolidated statements of financial position. First principle, 100%- Sorry, sorry, thank you very much, but don't move this. Now we are going to be delving into the first principle. Okay, you can proceed. 100% ownership of the subsidiary by the parents. There are situations where an investor company owns all of the voting rights in an investing company through ownership of the entire share of the latter. In this situation, the subsidiary is said to be wholly owned by the parent company. 100% ownership of a company by the parent in another company in the subsidiary will not give rise to non-controlling interests, formerly known as minority interests. Okay, we can let's stop there. Let's stop there, but uh, don't mute yourself yet. Let's stop there. Based on that understanding, we need to go back to our notebook. Okay. In our notebook, we then need to understand something that a subsidiary that is within a group, a group consists of parents and subsidiary, if it is one, or subsidiaries, if they are more than one. Now, this subsidiary we are talking about, what is when we have a group, I represent a group as this cycle. Therefore, within this group, we have the parents, and we have the subsidiary. In which case, the parents is the only investor in the subsidiary, owning all of the shares of the subsidiary. This form of a structure is what we know as only owned. Only owned subsidiary. We also have another structure where the group still comprises of the parents and the subsidiary. But in this case, the parent has less than 100%. Let's say for short, the parent has 80%. Therefore, it means Subsidiary need to be owned 100% by the number of shares issued. Therefore, it means outside the group, there are other investors. Outside the group, there are outside the group. There are other investors. It can be one, it can be two or more. Other investors in the subsidiary, okay? They own the remaining balance. The balance now is 20 watts percent. For this example, remember, it's an example, okay? It's possible the parent was 70, others will own 30. If the parents own 90, others will own 10. If the parents own 60, others will own 40. That's what it means. Now, these others, since, since the parents controls, therefore, we see the parent as a controlling interest. Remember, we discussed control before now. The parent is a controlling interest. Therefore, if the parent is a controlling interest, 
how do we describe or characterize these other ones? These other ones that form 20% will be characterized as non-controlling. Remember, you can have two masters in the ship. Therefore, if you already have a master as controlling, it then means others within the ship are not controlling what? Interest. And for shorts, we we'll consider them as NCI for shorts. But what it means is non-controlling interest. Okay. Okay, therefore we will be fixed with either only own subsidiary or what I will now come to consider in this case, this structure in this case is what is known as partly owned subsidiary. Partly owned what? Subsidiary. This is only owned, this is partly owned. Therefore, on that premise, I think you can go on to look at the first illustration to lay down the first principle. Over to you. Okay, sir. We can explore the principle of cons consolidating a whole owned subsidiary by, abduct by abducting this illustration. Illustration one, the consolidation of the statements of financial position of the dual companies, parents and subsidiary with 100% ownership of the shares of the subsidiary by the parents can be illustrated with the hypothetical scenario as shown below. Company P acquired 100% of the equity share of Company S on the 31st December 2015, which is the reporting date for the dual company. The statement of financial position of the two companies on this date stood as follows. State, statement of financial position as at 31st December 2015. PPE, plant, property, plant, and equipment. Parents, 300 million. Subsidiary, 130 million. Investment in S, 180. Under parents, subsidiary new. Current assets, 120 under parents, subsidiary 70. Total assets, under parents 600, subsidiary 200. Share capital and reserve. Equity share capital at one naira per share, 400 under parents, 120 under S. Reserve, retained earnings, 120 under parents, 60 under S. Total 520, 180. Current liabilities 80 under S, 20. Total equity and liability 600 under parents, 200 under S. Okay, thank you. What is the requirement? Can you read it from the Excel sheets? Prepare. The, I'm trying to see that. Okay. Prepare the consolidated statement of financial position as at 31st December 2015. Okay, thank you very much. Now, I've more or less uh, brought it into the Excel sheets. Okay, um, now what do we do? We are told to consolidate. Now, the first thing we need to take note of is to put up the group structure. Now, this is what the group structure looks like. Those diagram I drew the other time, it's good to do that for your understanding, but not necessary for examination. Okay, I've done that and I've got it down here. Okay, now you can see that, what is that? The group, we have P and we have S. And looking at the arrow, it reflected what is in the question to say P controls S, okay? As a result of having 100% stake in S, okay? And that you can see. Now, two dates are critical for us. 
two data what critical the date of acquisition and the date of consolidation. The date of acquisition can be likened to the date of birth of human being, which means everybody has a single date where you were born. Okay. Uh, whether uh, some people change their date and all sorts of things, that ones are imaginary or artificial. Everyone was born once. With the date you are giving birth to is your date of birth. Okay. Similarly, the first day in which an investor, in this case a parent, obtains the control of an investee, in this case a subsidiary, that date, being the first date of that control, is the date of acquisition. Now, the second date is the date of consolidation. The date of consolidation can always be likened to every year you recognize your birthday. And every year you recognize your birthday signifies that you have lived additional one year, regardless of what your age is. For every year of your birthday recognition, it signifies you have more or less moved up the ladder away from your date of birth at least by one year. And what it simply means is that your date of consolidation is the yearly or the reporting date in which you are consolidating that subsidiary away from your date of acquisition. What it simply means is this. For the first time, your date of acquisition and consolidation will be the same. Simply mean that you came to this world on so dates, let's say 31st December 2015, is when you're giving birth to. And that date will equally coincide with your first date on earth that you sleep on this earth which means at least for once, those two dates will coincide. But as time goes on, 365 days later, you spent one year away from your date of birth, which then means that it's now one year post acquisition and your reporting dates or your date of consolidation will be one year far apart from your date of acquisition which means a year apart from 31st December 2015 will now be 31st December 2016. Two years after will be 31st December 2017, like that, like that. Now, today, we will first of all start by introducing that we are accounting for the consolidation just on the first day you are in this age, which is the date of acquisition will coincide with your date of consolidation. Okay, and that is the issue here, because if you refer to the question, it says the acquisition took place on 31st of December, 2015. And likewise, we are told to consolidate the statement on the same date, which is the reason why for once, these two dates are the same. Okay, now what then is consolidation? Remember, Consolidation means on a line by line basis. We should do what? We should combine these two together. On a line by line what? Basis. Therefore, how do we do that? Those are the questions we need to answer. Now, how do we do that? It's for us to say, okay, we open, since we are familiar, we are starting at this level with the statement of financial position. We want to consolidate the two and describe it going forward as a consolidated statement of financial position. Now, in doing that, you have already agreed that consolidation force entails combining on a line-by-line -line basis, the elements of financial statement of the period and that of the subsidiary. In this case, we have the property, plant, and equipment. And to combine it, I have 300 for the period 
and I have one thirty for the subsidiary. And what that signifies is that I'm adding three hundred plus one thirty, and that gives me four thirty. Now, investments in S. I'll put some exceptions here. And you ask me why. For now, I want to ignore investment in S. It's too much. Okay, and we explain why we are doing it for now. Next is current assets. Therefore, my current asset for print is 120, for subsidiary is 70. Therefore, I'll come here, current assets, 120 and 70. And what does that signify? That means all other things being equal, my total asset is 620. But we still need to answer a question. Why are we ignoring investment in S? We'll come back to that. Now let's go beneath. We have the equity being represented by the share capital and results. Now the equity share capital also for now, I'm also going to ignore it. But I'm only going to ignore it for the subsidiary and not for the parents. Therefore, I'll be careful how I highlight it. which means the only one I have for now is that of the parents. And what is that of the parents? Is 400. Four hundred. Now again, we come down to results. What do you have in our results? Our result, we have the plan one twenty and the subsidiary. Therefore, also, I ignore it by lighting it, but I only do that for the subsidiary. Why are we doing this? We'll explain. That will lay the fundamental principle of the consolidation, which means what I have here is 120, since we have ignored that of the subsidiary. Now, for current liabilities, we have 80 and 20. Therefore, 80. 20. What should I do? 80 plus 20. Now we we'll finish consolidation. Now we've consolidated P and S to produce this account. The first thing that we notice is that our total assets equals total equity and liabilities. Now, on one side, I'm happy that it seems the equation balances based on the accounting equation. But on the second hand, I'm in for two reasons. Why? Why? 
why did I decide to ignore those yellow things? And it seems there's a pattern. Investment in S, which is under the parents, is what it, I ignored it. There's also a pattern. Both equity share capital and reserve of S, which is in the book of the subsidiary in this case, I also ignored it. Therefore, what is going on? Secondly, how possible on how did I selectively ignore and accept things and the account still look balanced? The question then is, is it a fluke? Or is it just by chance? Or is it that even when I ignore things, this situation will still come to a balancing position? Those are the questions the first principle will address. Okay, now let us go back to, let's go back to our uh, slide. Okay, that's our notebook. Now in our notebook, let us go back to the first accounting question. We said assets equals equity and liability. And we said when we collect like terms, which are these two, we can put them together and say assets less liabilities equals equity. And all things being equal, given that our equity is positive, which is a norm, it then means assets will have a more than equity uh, liability. Therefore, it will be net assets, which is net of assets. Okay, now there are two sides to every equation. There are two sides to every word equation. This is my left hand side, which must always equal to my right hand side for any equation towards to balance. Now, when you look at my left hand side, what have I done with my left hand side of the subsidiary and the parents? What I've done with my left hand side, which is made up of assets and liabilities, is that I've consolidated them. And that is what makes us do what we did here. Let's go back to the Excel sheets. That's why we did what we did here. Each of the assets, if you observe, PPE, component of print assets, and liabilities. Furthermore, what then happens to the equity side? The equity side In this case, by way of first principle, we have to be canceled out. And why are we doing that? We'll go back to our example. We are doing that because of what? Let's go back here. Now, we set aside investment in S, which is 180 million, 
We set aside ordinary share capital of S, which is 120 million. We set aside reserve of S, which is 60 million. Why do we do that? We do that because we wanted to achieve this first principle. Our first principle talks about cancellation. Now, what do we want to cancel out? We want to cancel out two things against one another to signify the exchange that took place at the point of acquisition. And what is the exchange that took place at the point of acquisition is that one, someone or investors part away with fund to acquire, thereby taking an investment. And the money is collected by the shareholders of the acquired entity in order to surrender the entity. And what are they surrendering in the entity? It's nothing other than the assets and the liabilities of the entity. Which means you use shares as an instrument of acquisition, but what you acquire in real sense is the asset of the subsidiary and the liabilities of the subsidiary asset business, which means you acquire the net worth of that business or net asset of that business. And therefore, the two things I'll be comparing are the cost of business combination, which is investment made by the investor or the investors. It is by the investor if it's only own subsidiary, which means only one investor is there, which is a pair. And it's by the investors if it is partly own subsidiary, which means the parents as a state and others collectively known as non controlling interests also have a stake. And I'm comparing that stake they have with the net worth of the business. And what is the net worth of the business is simply the net asset of the subsidiary at the date of acquisition, which means this process of cancellation only takes place at acquisition dates. This process takes place at acquisition dates. Okay, now what comprises the cost of business combination? In this case, we only have one investor and the investment here is 180X. We did not ignore this 180, we barely more or less accounted for it under a separate head, which is the first principle. And what is that? The 180. Now this 180 represents the purchase consideration of the parent in the subsidiary. Now, what then is taken over by the subsidiary is a net asset, which is represented by the equity position. And the equity position, based on our delineation when we were discussing conceptual framework, comprises of at least the share capital and the reserve. In this case, the share capital of S is 120, which is something that we think that we have ignored, which is that we did ignore it. And the reserve of S, which we thought we ignored, we did ignore it, is the 60. Now, what have we done? You find out that P has paid 180 to acquire S. And what is the value of S that was acquired at that date of acquisition? The value is represented by the right-hand side, which is the equity and share capital, which is synonymous to our discussion here to say the equity is representing the net worth asset. Therefore, if you have already consolidated the net asset, you can consolidate equity, but rather cancel it out because an exchange has taken what? Place. Therefore, what do you do? You have to cancel it out. The equity portion is canceled out, out because you can't eat your cake and have it. When you go to the market and you take money to the market, can you come back with that same money and come back with the goods? The answer is what? No. It then means that you part away with the money, which is the equity, 
and you come back with the goods, which are the assets and liabilities you have consolidated. Now, at the end of the day, you find out that what we have more or less parted away with, which is 180, is equal to a value to what we drop back from the market. And by so doing, it cancels out one another. And by cancellation, it simply means you never profited from that acquisition from day one because you pay exactly the value of what you acquired or what you bought. Which means I paid 180 million for what of a business that is equal to 180. It means from day one, we are exactly equal. I exchange 180 in money for 180 in net assets of a business. And that is that what that means that cancellation has taken place. And it's on this premise of cancellation that we seem to have ignored this and not necessarily that we ignored it. Which means this cancellation process is what allowed us to consolidate the assets and the liabilities. Now, when you check the asset now, we consolidated the assets. Which are put in red for the subsidiary to that of the third, we consolidated the current assets either. And we also consolidate liability. Consolidating the PP and the current asset give us 200 million being consolidated as assets. And in consolidating the liabilities, also gave us 20 million. And the effect is that we have to bear the obligation of the subsidiary. Which is net net. If we take 200 assets of the subsidiary and we assume 20 liability, it means net net. What we took over is net of a liability of 180, which also equates what we have paid as 180. Simply put, this is the first principle of consolidation. And in summary, what is it? In consolidating an, a subsidiary at the date of acquisition where the business formation took effect, you ensure you consolidate all assets and liabilities of the subsidiary as identified, okay? Why you cancel out the equity of the subsidiary as at the date of acquisition with comprises of capital and results only at the date of acquisition. And for short, what it simply means is that on the date of acquisition, more than necessary, you'll find out that what you have as ordinary share capital will always be that of the parent, and what you may find in your retained earnings is also that of the parent, all other things being equal. And this is the first principle we are laying, but we'll build on this principle as we move on. Any question for now? You have a few minutes to ask questions now before we move on to the second principle using similar illustration, if not the same. Okay, Timothy, over to you. Uh, yes, sir. So, uh, Sorry, your network is bad. Your network is bad. We can hear you. Okay, uh, can you hear me now? Okay, fair, continue. Okay, so I said that's the call acquisition greater than the cost of can you send the chat? I can barely hear you and it's cracking. Any other person? Any other person? Okay, all are very much. Oh, I'm sorry, very Where are you? Okay, can you unmute? Yes, yeah. good morning, sir. Good morning, yeah. Um, the principle of translation uh, would have uh, come in place if it was partly on subsidiary. Yes, and that is what we are going to discuss as we move to the second principle. Okay, sir. Yeah, thank you. Any other question? 
Any other hand? Okay, uh, don't be entertainment. How are you too? Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Yeah. Yes. The question I want to ask is as concerning the the one you painted on yellow as for 180. Is it is it on a on a on a normal on every occasion or as a situation may be that you have to keep it aside while working out for that one before you recognize it like you did when you are working on this? Okay, thank you very much. Uh you see, you see more things, more revelation as we move on. Okay. Okay, sir. Uh, for now, it seems that's what we we'll do. But as time goes on, when you are now exposed to some other things later, you know when and how it affects. Because as time goes on, not everything that shows us more 80 there, you probably have more legs gray out and carry out this operation on. Okay, but okay, again, sir. it's step by step. We'll get to that level. But for now, we are establishing a basic principle. And as I told you earlier, we'll be building on this principle as time goes on, where we'll be bringing in some complexities. And it's from simple to solve a complex problem. Thank you very much. Okay, I think we can move on. Now, the text also further provides you with more learning understanding at your own pace, where explanation is given for everything I've done by way of step one, step two, step three, step four, step five, step six, where you now console the date with further explanation. And also, it still provides you schedule that you can use for consultation. But we'll put that aside for now. For those that have the text, you can go through that. Now, who will volunteer to read uh, what will lead us to the second principle? And I want someone with uh, uh, no nice background, OK? But before that, I think I have a chat here from Timothy Samaila. Is it possible, Raphael, I will give you access to a mute, but just wait. You can mute now, but wait till I, uh, before you read the problem. Okay, let me answer Samela now. Uh, is, is it possible to have the cost of acquisition higher than the worth of subsidiary? Uh, those are the things that will lead us to as we move on. I want to say yes, I want to say no. Uh, you know, when you are watching the season film, You'll be anticipating what is next, and that's when you appreciate it. I won't give you yes, I won't give you no, because if I give you yes, I have to take time to explain, and we have not gotten to that principle. And if I say no, I still have to explain because you have not gotten to that. Okay, that's simply answer your question. Okay, Raphael, can you go on to the second principle? Thank you. Okay, good morning, sir. Good morning. Yes, sir. Hope my voice is uh, very clear, sir. Yeah, it's fair. Thank you. Okay. All right, second principle, less than 100% ownership of the ownership of the subsidiary by the parents. In most, of the, in most of the cases in the group, the ownership interest of the parent company is sometimes and usually less than 100%, which means wholly owned subsidiary are less common to partly owned subsidiary where part of the ownership interest in such subsidiaries is attributable to non-controlling interests. Non-controlling interest exists only where a subsidiary is partly owned by the parent company and the value of the non-controlling interest should be ascertained and shown as part of the total equity of the group, but classified under separate head which is known as equity attributable to non-controlling interest in the consolidated statement of financial position. IFR 3 R establishes the principle for recognizing and measuring the identifiable assets acquired. The liabilities assumed and any non-controlling interest in the acquiree. Any classification or 
designations made in recognizing these items must be made in accordance with the contractual terms, economic conditions, acquire, acquirers operating or accounting policies, and other factors that exist at the acquisition date. Each identifiable asset and or liability is measured at its acquisition date fair value. Non-controlling interest in an acquiree that has, that has parent ownership interest and entities, their holders to a proportionate share of the entity's net assets in the events of liquidation are measured at either fair value or the present ownership instrument proportionate share in the recognized amount of the acquirer, acquiree's net identifiable asset. All other components of non-controlling interest shall be measured at their acquisition date fair value unless another measurement basis is required by IFRS. Okay, technical notes. Okay, sir. Technical note: in a business combination achieved by contract alone, the acquirer shall attribute to the owners of the acquiree the amount of the acquiree's net assets recognized in accordance with this IFRS. In other words, the equity interest in the acquirees held, held by parties other than the acquirers are non-controlling interest in the acquirer's post-combination financial statement, even if the result is that all of the equity interest in the acquiree are attributable to the non-controlling interest. Okay, thank you. Can we, you now look at the illustration? We can further okay, explore sir. it. Okay, continue. Okay, sir. We can explore the principle of consolidating a partly owned subsidiary by adopting this illustration. Illustration two, Pali acquired 80% of the equity share capital of SUSE on the reporting date, 31, 31st December 2015. The statement of financial position of the two companies on this date is as shown below. Statement of financial position as at 31st December 2015. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, okay. Just list the item. Don't call the figure. Okay. For okay, property, plants and equipment, investment in SUSI, current asset, then total assets, then on the on the um, other end we have share capital or, or and reserve, equity share capital, at one naira per share. Reserve, that's retained earnings, then total equity. Then we have current asset, then total equity and liabilities. So okay. in order to, okay. Okay, that's, that's all. Now let us see what we are to do at this point. Okay, sir. Okay. At this point, we are required to consolidate uh, or prepare the consolidated statement of financial position as at that first of December 2015. Now, what is different about this structure and the other structure? Remember, it's the same question. But what is different in this structure and the other structure is nothing other than what I can show you here as a structure I've drawn. And what is it? You have Pali, which is a parent, Acquire Susie, which is a subsidiary, and the stake is 80%. What does that mean? It means you have other shareholders in Susie, which you consider as non what interest, and they account for the balance. That's why I say it at 20 what percent, which is that's the only difference here, which means instead of having 100% within the group, we have 80% within the group and 20% outside the group. The date of acquisition and date of consolidation still remain what? The same. And that is that. And that addresses the concern of what if 
we have a party on subsidiary as we proceed in console relation. The principle will be what? The same. Subject to we introducing additional principle, which we call second principle, or what we call the second consolidation mechanism. Okay, how do we do it again? If you recall, consolidation entails we should take line by line this 300 and what 130, we combine it together. And we do that across border like we have done before, subject to our understanding of principle one or first principle, which we are going to replicate here. Now, in this case, I will add for PP 300 and 130, and I'll also add for client assets, which is uh, 120 and 70, and the two gave me 620. 300 and 130, 120 and 70, gave me 620. Now, I still went ahead to ignore investment in Susie, okay? As we've done earlier. But in this case, having ignored investment in Susie does not mean in true sense I ignored. In true sense, what I did was to account for it under the first principle of cancellation. And what did I do is for me to come to the business combination to account for it in the cancellation procedure. And how do I account for it? Instead of me consolidating it, I'll bring it to the account where I'll be doing the cancellation, which means 144, I'll bring it here to cancel under the first principle, which means I did not ignore. I only take it away from the consolidation position because remember, we said we are not to consolidate the investments because we can't it out against the equity of the subsidiary acquired. And therefore, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Furthermore, I have equity. 400 of the equity is what I'll bring in. Why the 120 is what seems that I ignored, but not that I ignored, but I'm more or less merely going to cancel it out. I'll cancel this out, I'll cancel this out, all because they existed at the date of acquisition. What is left is 484, which I bring to this point. Now, what is next is current liability, 80 and 20. Therefore, my current liability, 80 and 20, what will I do? I will more or less add them together in similar fashion and have my hundred. Now there's a problem. My total asset is 620. My total liability and equity is 540, uh, 584, which means there's a difference of 36. The question then is, where is the difference coming from? What is that 36 all about? And therefore, let me put it in red. That the six speaks to something. And what is that? It speaks to the fact that unlike before, unlike before where we have 100%, which is only owned subsidiary, now we have 80%, which make it partly owned subsidiary. The question then is we have not accounted for the interest of others that we owe the fiduciary responsibility and duty to manage. Remember, even though we own 80% of the subsidiary, but we control the subsidiary 100%. Similarly, even though not all citizens vote for a president of a country or a governor, but the president and the governor controls all the resources of the country and state on behalf of those that are elected and those that do not elect. 
that same principle. It then means that we are yet to account for that of the non-controlling world interest. And I think that is what might be missing as it's 36. How do we do that? We then need to go back and say, okay, remember, okay, let me do this first. Um, remember this 120 and 60, we'll bring it here. We'll bring it to the point of cancellation. Okay, now it will lead us to second principle. What is my second principle? My second principle is simply that how do I account for non-controlling world interests at the date of acquisition? That means accounting for non-controlling world interests at the date of acquisition. What is the worth of those that owe 20% in the subsidiary? That is the question. What is in it for them? Those that owe 20% in this subsidiary. Now, let me now give you a simple question. Imagine you have 20% stake in a company and somebody say, what is your worth in that company? The simple thing you can do is for you to ask first, what is the worth of this company? The worth of the company is defined by the net asset of the company. Okay, the net asset of the company is 100 or is 500. Now, and I have 20% stake in that company. What does that signify? The worth of company is 100, uh, 500, and I have 20% stake in that company. It's simply to say 20% of my stake, 20% uh, stake of my in that company should be equal to 20% of that 500. Similarly, yeah, what we are saying here is that your net worth as non controlling interest in the subsidiary is simply equal to your proportionate share in the identifiable net asset of that subsidiary as at that date of acquisition. And what is your share? Your share is simply, remember, the net worth of the company at acquisition, which is represented by the right hand side, is the net asset. If you remember the principle of left hand and right hand side, I take you back to my work notebook. Remember, net asset is always equal to equity, which means equity at any point in time will be representing that net asset. And that's what we are doing, which means I can determine what my net asset is from the angle of equity. Therefore, it means my net asset is 180. Now, the question then is, the non-controlling interest hold 20% of that 180. What does that amount to? 20% of 180 simply amounts to that 36 million, which means we have been able to trace that 36 million, which is what you can see here. We are able to trace that 36 million to the investment of non-controlling interest in the subsidiary as a date of acquisition. If that then is the case, the problem we now have is that if you look at this equation, it didn't balance, yeah? Why? Because your cost of combination is no longer that of Pali alone, because Pali only owns 80%. It then means your cost of combination would be that of Pali that owns 80%, and that of non-controlling interest that owns 20%. It then means 80 plus 20 will not give you the whole, which is 100%. And therefore, it means there are two investors in this case. Who are the two investors? The parents are the non-controlling world interest. Now, what is the parent? Uh, parent is 144. Non-controlling is what you have derived here, which is 36. And therefore, I put the six there. It then means that the combined 100% ownership of the subsidiary is by way of investment of 180 million. Now, this 180 million is a combined contribution of the parents, which is Pali, and of the NCI in the subsidiary to own 100% of this network. And at the end of the day, it cancels out. Therefore, we can come here and say, our non-controlling interest 
equity attributable to non controlling interest is 36. And by so doing, the equation balances. And that is that. Okay, which means we've now exposed you to the second principle. That's our second principle. Okay, the second principle has shown you how you account for non controlling interest whenever the subsidiary is not only owned, which means you account for the state of non controlling interest for now as a proportion of the identifiable net assets. Okay, and that is that. Any question at this point? Any question at this point? Any question at this point? Which means now there will be two principles you come across at least where you have a partly owned subsidiary. Okay, the first principle, which is principle of cancellation, and the second principle, which is the principle of accounting for non controlling world interest at the date of acquisition. Position. Any other question? Okay, somebody said, please, can you explain non controlling interest? Non controlling interest are interest of other shareholders that does not consider that of the parents. Remember, the parent is a single enterprise, which is a business that owns probably majority, which allows it to control the entire company on behalf of other shareholders. Other shareholders that are not part of the parent are collectively considered as non controlling what interest. And the stake must be accounted for because you don't own it 100%, but you control it 100%. And I've explained the principle of control. Whether you vote for a governor or a president or not, you see your president and you see your governor. It's more or less control all of the resources of the state to the benefit of the citizen. And I believe that explains it further. Any other question at this point? Any other question at this point? Which means what is new year is, let me highlight it. Is the equity attributable to non controlling interest? Any other question? Okay, there's no question. Okay, somebody wants to ask a question. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask two questions, though um, it's just a bit confusing to me now, but not. As though I don't have an idea about it. That place we are having return earnings. I think that return earnings is still part of uh, profits made by the company, which they were not able to pay out either as dividend or whatsoever. That is what is uh, that return earnings. Yes, you know return earnings before. That's not true. Okay, sir. And second one is. Um, Having gone through this, as we are discussed now, can we still have access to this material after the lecture time? I think I've mentioned that before. Okay, maybe I've not joined before then. Okay, thank you. Now, okay, somebody is asking, how do you get 36? I think it is clearly stated here. I said, uh, that is why if you have 20% stake in a company, and somebody asks you, what is your worth in that company? You should ask yourself, what is even the entire worth of that company? The entire worth of that company is 180 million, which is the net asset. And you have 20% stake there. 20% of that 180 million is your 36. Very simple. Okay, uh, Omani, over to you. Okay. How many? Is there any other person? Okay. Okay. Somebody said, can you go over partly of subsidiary? I think there's no more to discuss about it. We'll discuss it extensively. Probably when you have access to the video, you can more or less reiterate. Okay. 
We say Patreon subsidiary. Probably you just joined. We explained what it is earlier. Patreon subsidiary is a situation you have the parent not owning hundred percent of the subsidiary, which means you now allow outsiders to own part of the business within the group. And those outsiders are collectively considered as non-controlling interest. And that is it. Thank you. Okay, who will volunteer to to more or less um, go through the last principle, which is the tough principle that we'll be considering today. I want somebody to volunteer. Okay, Z. I hope your background is okay. You can continue. Okay. Third principle, consolidation subsequent to acquisition and accounting for pre and post acquisition reserve in group accounts. In calculating goodwill, upon acquisition or gain for, from a bargain purchase, pre-acquisition reserves in, in taking into consideration in determining the fair value of the subsidiary net asset acquired, while post acquisition reserve will be added to the parent retained to the parent retained earnings. That is the reserves in ascertaining the consolidated reserves. That is the consolidated um, retained earnings. Pre acquisition profits are profits or losses of a subsidiary made and undistributed before the date of acquisition, and these profits or loss or losses are a component of the net asset that exists in the subsidiary as at the date of acquisition. Example, if a subsidiary called AVA PLC is acquired on January 1st, 2015, when its profits or reserves stood at 20 million naira, then the sum represents its pre-acquisition profits, which, which already is part of its net asset as at the acquisition date. Then we, are, we also have on post-acquisition profits, these are profits or losses made subsequent to or after the date of acquisition. These profits or losses will have arisen whilst the subsidiary was under the control of the parent company. And these profits or losses will be reported through the consolidated statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income, which end up in the consolidated retained earnings in the consolidated statement of financial position. Example, given the reserves of Lily PLC, stood at 20 million naira upon acquisition on January 1st, 2015. And as at reporting date subsequent to acquisition on December 31st, 2015, the reserve stood at 30 million naira and hence the, hence the post acquisition profit will stand as 10 million naira, being an increase in reserves to 30 million from 20 million naira. In another case, if the reserves as at That's all. Continue. Okay. If the reserves as at 31st, 2015 has been the sum of 15 million, the post acquisition reserves would have been a loss of 5 million, naira, being a decrease to 15 million from 20 million. Okay. Uh, <laughs> just don't mute. Or you can okay. mute if there'll be noise as a background because I'll still call you to read the question. But I want to switch to the notebook to explain. That All right. Okay, what are we saying at this point? What we are saying at this point is as follows. Pre and post acquisition profit. Or profit as the case may be. I believe you can see the notes I'm writing on. Okay, I guess so. Now, what it simply means, it means that there are two extreme ends. 
This first end is in date of acquisition. which let's say this is 1st of January, 2022. And let's say this is date of consolidation, the first reporting dates of our consolidation. Now, the date of attrition is when you took over the affairs of the company, where you obtain control. Let's say the profit of the company in that day is 10 million. No, sorry, the reserve is 10 million. Now, a year after, the reserve has grown to 24 million. The question then is what has happened? What has simply happened is that this 10 million you met is a profit or the reserve before acquisition and therefore we'll call it pre acquisition results. We call it pre-acquisition results because this is reserved before you acquire. This is what you met and it has been created before your involvement in that entity. But what have you created after you joined that entity? You have created, you have also contributed positively by taking 10 million to 24 million. And what you have done in a year is to have made additional 14 million in it. Positively. This 14 million is a post acquisition. Is that what it simply means is that your 24 million reserve is split into two pre and what post pre is always known and given because it's what you took over as part of the net asset, and that is 10 million. Post will always be the movement that has occurred, positively or negatively, which is 14 million. In this case, it's positive. Now, on the same vein, let me copy this. What if that is not what you meant? What if? In this second scenario, this 24 is no longer 24. Let's say it is 4 million. What it simply means is that since it took over, we have not been performing effectively. So that the reserve you took over was 10 million, but now the reserve is 4 million. It means you have contributed negatively. How much? Six million. It then means that your post acquisition reserve or loss is minus six million. Because instead of you taking us forward, you are taking us backwards. Okay, which means in this case, the four million. is now split between 10 and negative 6 million. And that's that. 
Now let me use another scenario. Let me use another scenario. The scenario here is that you met negative ten million. But you have taken negative ten million to twenty four million. Therefore, what have you done invariably? What you have done invariably is that you have contributed 34 million. Because for you to go from negative 10 to positive 24, it means you have made profit in that year to the tune of 34 million. To first of all, reduce negative to zero and add the additional 24. Okay, what that means in this case, our preacquisition is negative 10. Our post acquisition is positive 34. Now, let me also take it from this level. Let me say you make negative 10. And that negative 10 has not become that negative 10 has not become negative six. Have we done well? The answer is yes. You move from negative 10 to negative 6 means that positively in that year, you have contributed 4 million. Which then simply means that your negative 6 is as a result of you met negative 10 and you positively has created 4 million. And lastly, you met negative ten. And you have made it further negative fifteen million. What does that signify? It means it's not like from fire to fire bar. What that means you have created additional negative five million, which means your negative fifteen. Is as a result of negative 10 plus additional negative. What I've just shown you are scenarios that make you be able to split your reserves at the date of consolidation at every point in time into pre acquisition and post acquisition. And that is what we try to emphasize here. So that you don't need to cram anything, you should have the understanding. And that is that. Okay. Now, given that, uh, can you raise up your hand again so that I can give you access? I think Z. Let's see. Okay, Z. Okay. Now you can go ahead to read the problem and we'll use it to close 
our discussion for today. Thank you. Okay, proceed. We can explore. Okay. We can explore the principle of consolidating a partly owned subsidiary subsequent um, partly owned subsidiary subsequent to acquisition by adopting this illustration. Illustration three. Asana acquired 70% of the ordinary shares of Manchester United on 30th June 2015, when the balance in the later in the later retained earnings stood at 30,000 naira. Then we have the statement of financial position at 30th of June 2016. We have, they have the non-current assets, investment in Manchester United, current assets, um, shares and capital reserve, equity share capital at 1% share, reserves, and current liabilities. So in order to consolidate the statements of financial position of the parent, that's Asena, and the subsidiary, Manchester United, as at 30th June 2016, the following steps have to be followed. Okay, thank you. Now, let's look at the steps from our own angle here. Now, the first thing is that uh, after at 70% stake, what then will be non-controlling interest, given that this is a partly owned subsidiary? That simply means non-controlling interest will be the balance. If ASNA is 70% and the subsidiary have to be owned 100%, Automatically, the non-controlling interest will be thirty percent. Have I shared the screen? I think I have. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Therefore, that is that. Now, what does the structure look like? Like what I've shown you earlier, both in the structure and in how to separate pre-acquisition and post-acquisition. Now, look at here. At the date of acquisition, the retained earnings that was acquired stood at 30 million. Whereas today, the balance sheet has changed from 2015 to 2016, a year apart. You can find there that the reserve or retained earnings of Manchester United is now 50, which means it's a move from 30 to 50. Okay, now let us see how the structure looks like and how the movement looks like. Okay, this is structure. Asna at 70% in my whereas non-controlling interest is 30% being the balance. Now there's a year apart between the date of acquisition, which is started June 2015, and date of consolidation, which is started June 2016, a year apart, which means now we are celebrating the first birthday of the existence of this uh, marriage. Okay, that is that. Secondly, my you reserve. As at acquisition is 30 million, which you said is pre acquisition is up on 30th of June 2015. And today, being the date of consolidation, I are reporting the 30th June 2016. Asna's reserve, uh, sorry, Manchester United reserve is 50 million. Now, positive 30 has moved to positive 50. It means that Asna, which is the new owners of Manchester United, has printed additional 20 million based on the analysis we just uh, we did earlier, which is the summary here. And we can also find that by replicating that by mere splitting the reserve using this equation, which means you are looking at the movements in the reserve, okay? From the date of acquisition, which was 30, to today's date, reporting the 50, which is positively, we have 20, and that's what we need to do at that point in time. Okay, now let us consolidate. As you remember, the consolidation is to pick it line by line. Okay, what line are we picking here? We pick them line by line. Okay? And we'll be consolidating each line subject to whatever adjustment we need to do. Now to do that, let me start with property plant and equipment and also the current what assets. Now doing that is to add 500 plus 240 and add 140 plus 180. Okay. Now,
Remember, we said something about this. The investment in Manchester United. Therefore, what do we need to do? We need to bring it down to the point of uh, cancellation, our first principle. Now, in our first principle, we're sure we do the needful. By bringing it in, the investment of 196. Now, the next thing is to move to equity share capital. Equity share capital of the subsidiary will suspend it. And likewise, retain any of the parents will suspend it. Okay, which means what we do naturally bring here is 60186. 600. And 186. Okay, we are coming down. Now, current liability we consolidate 50 and 120. And when we consolidate 50 and 120, that gives us 170. Okay, now there's a problem. Our total asset is 1060, our total equity and liability is 956. Now, what is the difference? Maybe if you account for non-controlling what? Interest. Now, let's account for non-controlling interest. But before then, remember, these 250 and 50 will come here. Just pay attention as we address some things here. Now, what do we need to do? The second principle leads us to accounting for non-controlling what? Interest. And therefore, what do we do in this case? In this case, we more or less consider the 30% of the net worth assets. But the net asset here is saying 300. But is it truly 300 as at the date of acquisition? Remember, we said this position of first principle is a position that only takes place at the date of acquisition. Now, the question then is, was this reserve of 50 present as an acquisition? Let me put it in red. Now, this 50 will not be correct. Why? Because as an acquisition, the return earnings was 30. But what you are seeing in our balance sheet, which is a year after it's showing 50, it means that we have created additional 20. That 20 is post acquisition. And that is the reason why we need to split pre from post, because the pre is part of the net asset at acquisition, while the post will be treated separately and will come down to where we'll treat it. Which means what I need here is a pre acquisition reserve asset acquisition date. Okay. And that is Man United, not Susie. And therefore, what is that? That is 30. If you go back to our discussion, what is our preposition is our 30. And that 30 is what you are going to do. If I link it to 30, which is 280 is my the acquisition is there. Now, what happens to this 20? Let me take us to our notes. What will always happen to post acquisition? It's simple. Post acquisition profits. or loss is considered returns on investments since acquisition. And in that case, that amount will be split as a return to the shareholders. 
who are the shareholders? We have two categories of shareholders, the parents, which is one controlling, and the non-controlling what? Interest. Therefore, it means the share, let's say, for example, it is 100 million. And let's say the parent has 80%. The NCR has 20 what? Percent, which is a balance. Therefore, the parents will have 80% share of under, which is 80 million. And the NCR will have 10% share, which is what? 20 million. Now, what will happen is that the parents will then consolidate the 80 million to its retain ends to have what we call consolidated retain ends. Whereas the NCI will be added or subtracted to the NCI's position equity position as at date of acquisition. Therefore, that is what we'll do. And how do we do that? Is what is reflected in this uh, sheet, Excel sheet. How do we do that? We'll come back here to say, initially, NCI, is 30% of 280. Remember, 280 is the net asset, and NCI stake is 30 what percent. Therefore, it will be 30% of 280. And that gives us that give us 84. Now, this 84 seems to be familiar with this 84 because we need to account for non-controlling interest based on second principle, which is this 84. Now, what that means that ASNA contributed 196, NCI contributed 84. Both contributed 280 to own the stake of 280 at the date of acquisition. This is a zero. Now, even when we bring in this, 84. What do we find out? We still find out that there's a difference between 1060 and 1040. And what is the issue? The difference is 20. Have you seen 20 before somewhere? We have seen 20 here before. What does that mean? That means this 20 represents the post acquisition profit, which is attributable to the two shareholders in the ratio 70-30. That would now lead us to the top principle where we will be accounting for post-acquisition profits in order to arrive at the consolidated retained earnings. Which means the consolidated retained earnings is the retained earnings of the parents plus the portion of the post-acquisition retained earnings of the subsidiary that belongs to the parents. Which means in this case, the parents retained earnings before from the question we have was 186. This 186 plus 70% portion of this 20 represent the new retained earnings for the group, which means the parent has 186. Now, also, the parent is entitled to 70% of the post acquisition, which is a profit I was talking about. If you go back to this, my notes, where you need to share the profits. Okay, now we are now sharing 20 at the ratio of 70. And that is what gave us 14 in this question. Now, what do we do? The 14 will be added. That is 70% of 20. Mm 
will give us 14, which means the retained earnings of returns consolidated is now 200. That 200 is what you put there and not 186, which means going forward, it is now consolidated post-acquisition, which means we emphasize that going forward, post-acquisition, is no longer the retained earnings of the parent alone, it is the consolidated. Upon that, he still did not agree, 1060 and 1054. Why? Because also, not controlling interest, we are still carrying 84, which is at the date of acquisition, but the date has changed a year after acquisition. Therefore, we need to now apportion the balance of that 20 million to the non-controlling what? Interest. Now, what does non-controlling interest enjoy? Non-controlling interest initially was how much at acquisition? It was 84 at acquisition. Okay, now post-acquisition now is entitled to 30% of 20. Okay, let me put them in red. The parent adds 70% of 20. The NCR will have 30% of 20. And what is 30% of 20? 30% of 20. Where's our 30%? Yeah. Where's our 20? Yeah. And that gives us six. That six plus 84 gives us 90, which means between date of acquisition and now, our non-controlling interests have moved from 84 to 90 because the company has made profit of 20, which is entitled to 30% of it. Therefore, we come here and say, it's no longer 84 because we are reporting as at a year after, and a year after it has risen to 90. And on that premise, we are able to more or less arrive at the same position, which is what we have simply done at this point is to more or less introduce us to the fact that post-acquisition, there might be profit or loss being the movement between the reserve at acquisition and the reserve at reporting date. And that reserve or profit or loss will be shared between the parent and NCI, okay? And the portion you share to the NCI will change the value of the NCI from what it was at acquisition. And the portion you allocate to the parent will increase or decrease the parent retained earnings and give what we consider as consolidated retained earnings. On that premise, we now have a balanced position here, which means the balanced position here focus on consolidated retained earnings, which is a principle introduced only after post-acquisition profit is obtained or post-investment, and likewise, the aspect of non-controlling interest. Any question on this part? Now, the top principle has been laid down, and simply put, the top principle is after acquisition, automatically the retained earnings or the results will no longer be the same. Is that they are increasing? or they are reducing. And whether increase or reduction, it constitutes a return. Return can be positive, can be negative. If it's positive and you share it, it increases the investor's position. If it's negative and you share it, it reduces the individual investor's position. And we'll come back to agree on our position as it is here. Any other question at this point for us to call it a day? Any other question at this point for us to call it today? Thank you. Any other question? Okay, in the absence of no question, okay, we will continue from where we stop in the next class where all of these principles will not build upon them in the next class. Okay, in the next class, we'll be looking at further principles that is not going to be built upon these fundamental principles. Somebody say, why giving us 45 million? I don't understand. I believe you can see my screen. 
Where are you talking of 45 million and 25 million posts? I don't think I understand your question. Illustration, it is illustration. Which illustration are you talking about? Okay. It seems I don't get what you are talking about. Okay, at that point, uh, you can listen to the video again. And I'm going to share the notes and the workbook that we have used. Thank you very much. And God bless you, bless you guys. Bye.